I have a question. Uh, should we um, ask the uh, participants who are asking questions or making comments to just say where they are from so we can, you know, just try to ensure a, a balance, regional country balance of comments and questions? Yes, and in fact, we already have over 109 attendees who can hear us, so uh, I think oh, that's okay. <laughs> a request we're already putting to all of you. Please ask questions and please say, you know, where you're from and your name. Uh, Anne-Marie, you're muted if you want to say something. Sorry, yes, just on the questions, the questions are to be written into the question and answer column, right? Right, okay. <clears throat> yeah, the Q&A, yeah. We're looking, we, we have two, uh, yeah, two boxes, although Agnieszka is the one monitoring specifically the Q&A. Yeah, and the participants only have access to the Q&A. All right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we have uh, 128 people online, so Mavic, I think we can, we can begin. My, okay. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. I am Mavic Cabrera Baleza, the founder and chief executive officer of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Before I continue, please join us for a minute of silence in solidarity, reflection, and respect for the Black community and all people of color in the United States and globally in the struggle for racial equality and justice. We as intersectional, feminists and peace builders strongly condemn police brutality and institutional racism. We also express our grief and solidarity with everyone who lost a loved one due to COVID-19. Thank you. Welcome to the panel discussion, Ensuring Women's Political and Economic Empowerment After Conflict and Crisis, Gender in Peace Deals and COVID-19 Responses that the Global Network of Women Peace Builders is organizing with the New York University Center for Global Affairs and UN Women. During this COVID-19 crisis, many functions of governments, the United Nations and other institutions slow down or cease. The implementation of peace agreements is one of the processes that have been negatively affected as we've seen in countries like Colombia, the Philippines, and South Sudan. Financial, human, and technical resources for the implementation of peace agreements are shifted to COVID-19 response. However, this is a self-defeating strategy since conflict and violence amplify the impacts of the pandemic. And conversely, the pandemic is also a conflict multiplier. Furthermore, we are also aware that despite the alarming threats posed by COVID-19 pandemic and the global calls for ceasefires, the fighting continues in different countries, including Iraq, Libya, Syria, and Yemen, and the cumulative impact of the Israeli occupation continues to devastate the Palestine. We at the Global Network of Women Peace Builders believe that peace cannot wait. Together with our local partners, we continue our peace building work to ensure that peace will not be a casualty of the pandemic. We see this moment as an important time to re-examine our collective achievements as peace builders, particularly in our advocacy for the integration of gender perspectives in peace agreements. This is why, we are extremely grateful for our partnership with the NYU Center for Global Affairs that enabled us to analyze the implementation of peace agreements, particularly the gender provisions in them, and their impact on women's political and economic participation. We are honored and happy to have this discussion today, wherein we will launch the key findings of this research. We are also grateful to UN Women's continued support to women's participation in peace negotiations and the implementation of peace agreements. We are honored to be co-sponsoring this discussion. I want to express our deep gratitude to the students who conducted this research under the supervision of Dr. Anne-Marie Getz, my co-moderator today. Uh, and they are Gillian Abale, Emma Grant, Futaini Papagiotti, 
Tori Reisman, and Nicole Smith. Last but not the least, I would like to thank the governments of Austria, Canada, and Norway for their support that enable us to work with local women and youth peace builders and male gender equality allies and representatives of governments, UN, and regional organizations to implement the peace agreements. The findings of this research and the advocacy messages we develop are of critical importance as we not only face an unprecedented global pandemic, but also approach the 20th anniversary of Resolution 1325 and Generation Equality Forum that commemorates the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action. A reflection on women's meaningful participation in peace processes cannot be missing from these historical occasions. Today's discussion will contribute to such critical reflection. We will hear from women activists and former negotiators on opportunities and barriers for women's meaningful participation. We also hope to solicit greater support from member states, the UN, and the rest of the international community for women's engagement in peace processes, the implementation of peace agreements, and post-conflict political and economic recovery. Additionally, we hope that the discussion on the impact of COVID-19 will generate ideas on what gender and conflict-sensitive crisis responsive should look like. We have a lot to discuss and we have a formidable lineup of speakers. Therefore, without further ado, I will now turn it over to our brilliant moderator, my co-moderator, Dr. Anne-Marie Getz, clinical professor at NYU Center for Global Affairs. I remember when we first sat at the Vienna Cafe at the UN headquarters here in New York over a year ago and discussed this research. We are so proud of what this partnership has already achieved and we look forward to the discussion. Please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to Professor Anne-Marie Getz. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, join this discussion today and to be the co-moderator. Uh, my name is Anne-Marie Gutz, as, as Madik said, I've been working or we've been working with the um, Global Network of Women Peace Builders and are delighted to offer this uh, discussion along with UN Women as well today about what constitutes, how do you measure meaningful participation in a peace process. Um, just quickly, what is the Center for Global Affairs where I teach? It's a department at New York University where we offer a two years master's degree in global affairs and you can concentrate on cybersecurity or international relations or gender or transnational security or development and humanitarian and international law, a range of other um, topics. Um, the students on this course who um, are going to be represented today by one of them, um, uh, Fotini Papagiotti, uh, have the option, in addition to taking uh, normal uh, thematic courses, of doing what's called a practicum. And a practicum is a little bit like a hands-on policy task with a partner, and in this case, it was the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, who ask a question and the students set themselves to the task of analyzing the question, given the limitations of doing research remotely. And if there's any donors out there who ever want to support um, making on the ground research possible for students, uh, we'd love to get in touch. Um, but in this particular case, um, the practicum worked for the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, and it's a competitive process. There were five students involved. They have to apply. Um, they're selected from a, a panel of students who do apply. Um, and they were asked by the Global Network of Women Peace Builders to look into the conditions under which women's participation in peace processes produces tangible outcomes. Now, um, the students have prepared a presentation and I will leave it to them to explain how they broke down the question, but I do want to name them again, Emma Grant, Nicole Smith, Jillian Abale, and Dori Reisman, and uh, Fotini Papagiotti, as I mentioned, will be presenting the findings. Um, 
Uh, now, uh, as I said, um, one of the, like the focus is on what constitutes meaningful or impactful participation. And the wonderful thing about the agenda today is that we're going to get a chance to hear from a number of women peace negotiators, including the one who came up with the, the phrase meaningful participation, and that's Miriam Cornell Ferrer uh, from the Philippines. And we will also be joined by Nigeria Rentieros and uh, Ayak Chol Deng Alak from South Sudan. We're also going to be joined by Mireille Afa from UN Women, who handles women's engagement in peace processes. Um, but the agenda will start, as I mentioned, with Fotini Papagiotti laying out the research project and how the students tackled it and what they found, followed by Agnieszka uh, Faldutra Santos from GNWP, who um, is going to talk about the advocacy implications of some of the findings. And then I'll get into introducing each of the peace negotiators. Just a few points to mention at this stage. Um, one of our speakers, Nigeria Rentieros from Colombia, is going to be speaking entirely in Spanish. There will be a translation in English available in your chat panel on the side, um, as well as a summary offered in English by a GNWP staff member, um, Cecilia Lazada. Um, in addition, um, as was mentioned earlier, if you have questions to ask, you can do so in the Q&A panel. Please mention where you come from when you ask the question, your name and where you come from, so that we have an idea of the, um, of the distribution of uh, questions. Um, finally, just to let you all know that this webinar is available or will be streaming live right now on GNWP's Facebook page. Um, and you'll also be able to see it um, af afterwards on the YouTube, um, I guess on GNWP's YouTube channel, I'm assuming. Um, but anyway, there will be information posted about that. And in addition, as we go along, feel free to engage on social media with the hashtag Women Build Peace. Um, and every panel, as you can see, every uh, slide includes at the top right hand corner the um, Twitter handles if you want to um, raise awareness or raise provocative questions about the, um, about the process. So because we've, we're very tight on time, I'd like to now hand over to um, uh, Fotini Papagiotti. I would love to give elaborate uh, present, uh, introductions about Fotini, but that would be unfair to the other four students who can't speak today. So I'm going to hand over directly to her and she'll be followed directly by Agnieszka. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you all for being with us today. So our team at the CGA, um, let me name them again, Jillian Avali, Emma Grant, Dory Reisman, Nicole Smith, and myself, led by Professor Goods, formulated the research question with the GNWP team in order to fill the gaps in existing evidence about women's participation in peace processes. So we designed the question so that it would be useful for advocates and practitioners on the ground, and also realistic given the types of data that we have available. So to address the question of what can improve outcomes for women after a conflict, we decided to test the impact of gender sensitive peace agreements and of women's participation in peace negotiations on women's political and economic inclusion five years post conflict. To do so, we used research on gender sensitive peace agreements developed by Jackie True and Yolanda Riveros Morales identifying 51 countries with peace agreements signed between 2000 and 2016. So 25 of those included some form of gender provision, which True and Morales classified as any reference to the gendered implications of conflict, transitional justice, economic empowerment, or international women specific or human rights mechanisms. And women had been involved as signatories or participants in track one and track two negotiations for 23 of the agreements in our data set. We explored many possible indicators to test for downstream effects, and based on data availability and consistency, we selected the percentage of women in national legislatures as a measure of political representation, and women's labor force participation, gross national income, and the ratio of female to male gross national income as measures of economic inclusion. So in line with previous research, we did confirm that women's participation is indeed important. It is associated in our data set with um, a 37.4% increase in the likelihood that the agreement will include gender provisions. 
And more importantly, women's participation was a better predictor of improved outcomes for women than gender provisions, particularly when we tested our hypotheses on economic inclusion. Consistently there, women's participation in peace agreements predicted a higher labor force participation rate, a higher gross national income, and a lower female to male GNI ratio five years post-conflict. However, it should be noted that even then, um, economic effects were marginal and women's economic inclusion largely remains unaddressed and unchanged in the post-conflict period. Um, one type of gender provision that does make a difference is quotas for political representation. In our research, they were associated with a 9.2% increase in women's political representation. We found that reserved seats are the most effective um, at ensuring female representation in parliament. And overall, when quotas are introduced, women use each successive election to increase their share of parliamentary seats. Um, that finding that women's participation is more likely to improve economic and political outcomes for women than gender provisions and peace agreements was somewhat surprising to us. But of course, that does not mean that gender provisions are not important. Rather, it seems that we need more research to refine the definition of gender provisions and focus on actionable commitments that can have real impact. And this is especially relevant and needed in the case of economic inclusion. We need dedicated measures similar to quotas, which can be introduced as early as the peace negotiations and lay the groundwork for better economic outcomes for women. And identifying such concrete measures can be important for implementation. We see that gender provisions are generally adopted either when women mobilize early and are brought into the negotiations at an early stage, or when such provisions are imposed by the international community. Um, in the first case in Colombia, for example, we have seen backlash delay the implementation of these provisions. Whereas in the second, when we have the involvement of the international community, we know that such external enforcement may not generate the buy-in necessary to sustain implementation. And of course, all these points raise um, important advocacy and policy issues that um, Agnieszka will now talk um, about in more detail. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fatini, and, and uh, once again from myself, Personally, uh, thank you to the uh, NYU Center for uh, Global Affairs for this partnership. Um, the partnership is important because generating this type of evidence and analysis uh, is really crucial for civil society advocacy for better and more meaningful participation of women in peace processes, implementation of peace agreements, and political and economic participation after conflict. And uh, to us at JNWP, these findings that Fotaini just presented uh, are important both to us and to our partners on the ground, many of whom are, are watching and listening today, uh, because they provide important insights and, and evidence to strengthen our advocacy around the things that we already knew, we already saw, but now have, have uh, concrete evidence to back it with. So three key recommendations that I wanted to pull out from the richness of, of this research uh, are the following. Uh, one, design inclusive and participatory peace processes. Meaningful participation of women requires an, a thoughtful and intentional design. Participatory design is a design that is built on broad-based and diverse participation across age, race, ethnic group, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, etc. It's a design that recognizes that women are not a homogenous group, and uh, this is reflected in the way they are included in the peace process. Moreover, participatory design is also a design that goes beyond tokenism and acknowledges that advisory and observer roles uh, for women in peace processes are, are not enough as a mode for meaningful participation. In terms of the, of the how of, the, of designing participatory peace processes, it's probably a whole separate discussion. Uh, but one thing that we do hear uh, a lot in our work and from our partners on the ground is that strengthening uh, links between official track one negotiations and informal or unofficial track two and three processes where women are at the forefront uh, is really a critical part of designing more participatory peace processes. Recommendation number two, commit to concrete 
actions. The research that Fotheini just summarized has shown that quota are among the most effective gender provisions. To us, um, what we take away from this is the more specific a gender provision, the more likely it is to be implemented, as is the case with the quota. Simple references to gender, to Resolution 1325, to CEDAW, uh, in-peace agreements are important, but they are not enough. Gender provisions in peace agreements have to be actionable, context-specific, and accompanied by a concrete implementation framework that includes a timeline and a budget or a concrete mechanisms, uh, mechanism for how funds will be guaranteed. And uh, I had the privilege of, of being able to talk, chat about this with uh, uh, Miriam Coronel Ferrer, uh, one of our um, panelists today, uh, about how that was resolved in the Philippines, but you know, through a mixture of, of um, including a percentage of overseas development aid that would be set aside for the implementation of gender provisions or setting up a trust fund or a pool mechanism towards that. That's an important part of a commitment and of con uh, concretizing the, the gender provisions and peace agreements. And another important part is localizing the provisions. Localizing meaning translating them into actions that make sense, that are relevant in local communities and integrating them into existing local plans and local policies so that they can be implemented. And I just wanted to briefly take this opportunity to recognize and, and thank Norway for their support to our work, GNWP's work in Colombia and the Philippines that just that, uh, does just this and also to recognize our local partners, uh, the Center for Peace Education at Miriam College in the Philippines and Balay Mindanao in the Philippines, as well as the Red Nacional de Mujeres um, in Colombia, who are on the call uh, today. So, buenos dias, Beatriz, como estas? Um, third recommendation, invest in women's economic empowerment post-conflict. Like Fotheini said, this is something we don't fully understand yet, the mechanisms that would allow for better economic outcomes for women after conflict. So there is a need for more research. But we also see there is a need for more support. And we hear from our partners on the ground requests and calls for um, challenging and changing discriminatory laws and systems. Oh, your use of Wi Fi got unstable. Hello, is my Wi Fi unstable? No, Ignashka, you're fine. Please continue. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, there is also a need to support women's uh, economic inclusion, and that includes uh, inclusion at the level of decision making. We need to change discriminatory laws and systems, and that can only happen if women are part of making the decisions about post-conflict economic recovery. But at the same time, what we see is that the small economic empowerment initiatives should also not be discounted because they do have um, knock-on or, or uh, downstream effects. For example, we've heard from young women whom, whom we've worked with in the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo that running their own small businesses increased their decision-making power in their families and communities, uh, resulting in, in them being able to more uh, meaningfully participate in peace building uh, in the longer run. So these three recommendations are not new. We've heard all that before. We've, we've known that for years. Uh, but we are glad that now we have more nuanced understanding on how they can be translated into practice. So we look forward to continued partnership with the Center for Global Affairs to further deepen this understanding and, and continue to inform our uh, advocacy with, with the findings. Uh, so once again, thank you to Anne-Marie for her generosity with her time and expertise throughout this process. Thank you to um, Dori, Emma, Fatini, Jillian, and Nicole for their excellent analysis. And thank you also to UN Women who are our co-sponsor today for this, uh, for this um, event and, and more broadly for your commitment to women's meaningful participation. I'll stop here and I look forward to a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Agnieszka and Fotini. And here is our panel. And we are indeed fortunate today to have such an extraordinary lineup of experienced peace negotiators and activists. Uh, and by the way, I apologize. You may have heard me trying to sort out a Wi-Fi problem that I was having. I hope you can all hear me now. Um, our first speaker is Nigeria Rentiera, speaking to us from Colombia this morning in Spanish with the simultaneous translation on the side in English. And halfway through, we'll have a quick English summary and at the end as well. 
um, uh, Nihari, of course, was a negotiator um, uh, during the peace talks. And she's a lawyer, she's been involved in city governance, ethnic minority representation. She also has to run early from the call today because of her job as a prosecutor. So without further ado, por favor, Nigeria puedes. Thank you. Gracias. Iniciado el proceso de paz, cuando se había avanzado el tercer punto de los cinco abordados, en el 2014, el gobierno nacional y la FAREP acordaron crear una subcomisión de género compuesta por integrantes de ambas delegaciones para revisar y garantizar con el apoyo de expertos y expertas nacionales e internacionales como la ONU Mujeres, en mi caso, la cual apoyó eh, dándome en asesoría, brindándome eh, todo este tipo de eh, situaciones pertinentes que los acuerdos alcanzados y un eventual acuerdo final tuviera un adecuado enfoque de género. Esta decisión de gran relevancia para las mujeres en Colombia y en especial las víctimas del conflicto, puesto que analizar los acuerdos con un enfoque de género garantizó inclusión, equidad social y participación, lo cual nos acercó a un acuerdo que representara los intereses de hombres y mujeres que estaban totalmente pendientes, por ello, Hoy es impensable que las conversaciones o diálogos de paz que se realicen en el mundo no incorporen el tema de género como un aspecto central y transversal, pues se debe considerar a las mujeres como sujetas de derechos y actoras en la construcción de paz. Lo anterior no quiere decir que al 100% en nuestro país se hubiera trabajado en pos de la construcción en este proceso de paz. Sin embargo, es de resaltar que hubo gran interés por las mujeres, por las organizaciones de mujeres en los diferentes territorios de ser partícipes directas y así lo hicieron manifestar y lo hicieron conocer a través de diferentes herramientas las cuales después fueron tenidas en cuenta como fue la participación directa en esta plataforma. Utilizar la transversalización de género como estrategia para accionar en lo público permitió que se tomaran en cuenta los intereses y necesidades de hombres y mujeres en el diseño, implementación, monitoreo y evaluación de planes y programas en todos los ámbitos políticos, sociales y económicos en este proceso de paz, con un enfoque de género en los puntos acordados, lo que garantizó que ahora los planes de desarrollo con enfoque territorial participen directamente las mujeres en el territorio, en su construcción, y sus inquietudes o recomendaciones sean incluidas, pues esto fue abonado justamente desde la construcción de los acuerdos. Este proceso agrupó diferentes actores en el territorio. Hombres, mujeres, víctimas, campesinos, indígenas, afrocolombianos, población LGTB, personas en condición de discapacidad y autoridades locales de los 170 municipios priorizados, igualmente se ha empoderado a líderes y lideresas y las pedurías ciudadanas en la transformación en sus territorios. Es de anotar que hay unos temas claves como la participación política, punto del acuerdo que presenta mayores retrasos en su implementación y es necesario adelantar. Por ejemplo, la reforma política, la promoción de la participación de organizaciones y movimientos sociales para su trámite ante el Congreso. Este tipo de asuntos están pendientes de ser impulsados. Pero también es de resaltar que dentro del implementado, la adopción del Estatuto de la Oposición representa un avance importante para la participación política en el país y la materialización de este derecho consagrado en la Constitución Política de 1991. Con la implementación de esta medida, se brindan garantías a las organizaciones políticas declaradas en oposición al gobierno para el desarrollo de su ejercicio crítico, así como la inclusión de la equidad de género como uno de los principios rectores de la oposición. Compartirán el ejercicio de los derechos que les son propios entre hombres y mujeres de manera paritaria, alternativa y universal. Esto está en, 
incluido en el primer informe al Congreso sobre el estado de avance de la implementación del Acuerdo de Paz 2016-2019 de la Procuraduría General de la Nación, rendido eh, a finales de 2019. So, the creation of the Gender Stop Committee in the peace process between FARC and the Colombian government in 2014 was a major achievement. It guaranteed that the peace agreement has a strong gender focus and that women and other marginalized groups are represented in the design, implementation, and monitoring of the implementation plans for the agreement at the local and national level. However, despite some progress, uh, such as the adoption of the Statue of the Opposition with a, uh, with a strong gender lens, uh, the implementation of the peace agreement, and in particular, the provisions and political participation faces many delays. Nigeria? Bueno, ¿cómo está afectando el COVID-19 a la implementación inclusiva del Acuerdo de Paz? Podríamos decir que se ha iniciado este proceso de implementación desde 2016, pero es necesario indicar que ha tenido muchas dificultades. No hemos tenido un proceso de implementación que marche al 100%. Sin embargo, se insiste entre nosotros como colombianos en avanzar en el tema de implementación para lograr una paz estable y duradera. Pero ahora hay que decir que eh, los avances que se venían desarrollando eh, junto al gobierno nacional y las organizaciones sociales, los territorios eh, donde eh, se priorizó precisamente la implementación, estos avances vienen siendo muy lentos, pero ahora con el COVID-19 se está pues, afectando toda la implementación de una política pública inserta en los planes de gobierno y de desarrollo municipal, departamental y nacional, lo cual lleva a agudizar más la crisis sanitaria y alimenticia en las comunidades, pues prácticamente se ha paralizado su implementación. Todos sabemos que Colombia atraviesa por un momento bastante difícil y aún estamos en esta etapa donde tenemos que estar resguardados y protegidos en nuestros hogares pero en las comunidades más alejadas, las cuales estaban necesitando de forma urgente se pudieran llevar a cabo toda esta línea de acción que ya había sido concertada en, en diferentes estadios eh, participativos donde las mujeres tuvieron un papel muy importante, en estos momentos está a espera de que pueda resolverse eh, y este impasse que tenemos en nuestra sociedad. Las comunidades vienen trabajando un plan de acción con equipo médico y psicosocial, donde inducen los cuidados necesarios a las regiones o territorios más alejados. Es necesario decirles aquí de que los territorios donde se realizaría la implementación de los acuerdos de paz habían sido justamente los más vulnerables, los más pobres, donde los índices de necesidades básicas insatisfechas son los más elevados incluso en nuestro país. Y esto, ante esta emergencia sanitaria, se ha agravado mucho más pues carecen de vías de acceso, de comunicación, internet. Sin embargo, es preocupante, pues justamente estos territorios marginados, marginados eh, no cuentan con infraestructura médica y de servicios adecuados que permita atender en caso de un contagio del COVID-19 a pacientes y por lo tanto deben ser trasladados a otras regiones con todas las dificultades de transporte existente en estos momentos. ¿Qué se pensaría? Realmente los territorios donde se implementaría el acuerdo de paz suscrito con la FARC-EP son comunidades que en su mayoría están ubicadas en sectores rurales, como ya se, dije, ya se dijo, y que eh, pertenecen a comunidades negras, indígenas, campesinas, víctimas, mujeres y hombres que han venido tratando de superar todo el embate que le causó este conflicto armado por más de 50 años en Colombia. Y ahora presentan unas dificultades mucho mayores a las de las personas que viven en las zonas urbanas. La falta de empleo influye en la capacidad de generar ingresos y la disminución en la capacidad de acceso de niños y niñas al sistema educativo. 
eh, pues hay que resaltar que se está realizando de manera virtual. Esto se ha podido adelantar eh, fácilmente en ciudades, capitales, con tecnología, pero en estos territorios se carece de conectividad. Igualmente, es de indicar que la seguridad alimentaria está en riesgo, lo que hace más vulnerable a las comunidades, ya que deben desplazarse en busca de alimentos que no se producen en sus territorios o poder obtener las ayudas del gobierno nacional, sobre todo a las madres cabeza de familia para sus hijos, aumentando la posibilidad de riesgo y de contagio. Considero que sobre esta situación es necesario un mayor apoyo del gobierno nacional. Comunidades del Pacífico, pero también población de otros territorios, como en la costa atlántica, eh, al sur de Colombia y en la Guajira, han manifestado que estos territorios siguen aún afectados por el conflicto en el sentido de que es necesario salir de estas dificultades que van en un aumento y se requiere un mayor apoyo del gobierno nacional. Se necesita una mayor voluntad política de implementación una vez se supere esta etapa de emergencia para lograr que las comunidades puedan tomar rápidamente la recuperación y empoderamiento. Pero mientras tanto es necesario aumentar las posibilidades de atención y prestación de todos estos elementos de emergencia en necesidad y en temas de salubridad, pero también alimenticio, a fin de salir de la situación de pobreza extrema en la que se encuentra la mayoría de los municipios priorizados para la implementación del Acuerdo de Paz. Además, se puede lograr una mayor protección de líderes y lideresas sociales, los cuales por tener una representación y reconocimiento territorial, tienen todos los días amenazas que siguen latentes en los territorios posconflicto. Es más, aún se vienen presentando situaciones donde no solamente han sido amenazados, sino que también se han estado desarrollando actitudes o actividades de atentados contra ellos, contra su vida, contra la integridad personal, pero también la de su familia, lo que genera aún zozobra y eh, preocupación en el territorio. Gracias. COVID-19 further contributed to slowing down the implementation process. It affected access to employment and education, especially in rural areas, which includes most of the conflict affected communities. Uh, as we emerge from this crisis, there is a need for greater support from the national government to the territories that are still affected by conflict. More political will for the implementation of the peace agreement and even more protection for social leaders, including women. Thank you. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Um, uh, as you can see, each of the speakers, can you hear me? Each of the speakers has been asked to reflect on the gender provisions in their peace process um, and challenges to implementation, as well as the impact of the COVID process. And of course, the Colombia peace process had both high levels of participation of women and extraordinary gender provisions. We turn now to the next speaker, to Miriam Coronel Ferrer. And here she is, um, who of course is the chief, was the chief negotiator, the first in the world, the first woman chief negotiator in the world on the government side in the peace negotiations with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in Southern Philippines. Um, Miriam is currently a senior mediation advisor to the United Nations and has vast experience in the work of mediation and of implementing the peace agreement. So um, over to you now, Miriam, thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and um, hello to everyone. Um, definitely, women ve played very important roles in our process. They were inside the room, at the table, outside the room. Uh, during the negotiations, uh, half, almost um, most of the delegation coming from the Philippine side, Philippine government side were women. And we, we really have to thank the role of women's groups who supported the process throughout and gave us strength. And also ensured that the law that needed to be passed to operationalize autonomy in the region, which is now called Bangsamoro. So unlike in Colombia, this is, uh, this is an autonomy issue. And, uh, 
the, the conflict had to do with the segment of the population, the minority Muslim population in the South of the Philippines. So it was very important that more provisions, gender provisions, will be put into the law that will create the region, the autonomous region. And in that sense, also women played a very big role, including women legislators in Congress. And we do have to thank them for that. The agreement provided for two major strands, gender responsive strands. One has to do with the meaningful political participation of women, of course, reiteration of the principles of non-discrimination non and protection for all forms of violence. And the other strand has to do with the economic, socioeconomic side, the recognition of the role of women in development, um, uh, climate justice, the need to provide for gender responsive offices, programs, policies, and funds. So um, the BOL made this more specific and provided for additional guarantees. Uh, it stipulated very clearly that um, the, there shall be a gender and development budget. Um, not only the percentage of, from the ODA received by the Bangsamora government, as Agnes has mentioned, in the agreement it says 5%, but you will find that in the law this has, this has been made from 5% to 30% of ODA shall go to gender responsive programs. In addition to the 5% um, that shall go, 5% uh, budget of each ministry, office, and local government that shall go to uh, such uh, gender and development programs within the framework of a broader gender and development plan. So it's very important that that kind of a plan actually be put in place so that um, you do have meaningful programs uh, that will um, be duly funded through this budget allocation. Uh, the Annex on Normalization talked about uh, the normalization or return to normal life of uh, former combatants and people who have been affected by the conflict. And it did also provide for provisions, specific provisions that will benefit the Women's Auxiliary Brigade of the Moral Islamic Liberation Front, widows and orphans, and, um, and the BOL further emphasized that in decision-making, in all aspects of security and peace, peace building, the women should also be consulted. Both the agreement and the law recognize customary rights and traditions of the Bangsamoro people, uh, but it qualified that this should be on the basis of non-discrimination, which is a very important check against you know, not very progressive or even anti-women cultural beliefs and practices. Now, let me go to the implementation. So finally, it took some time to pass the law, actually. It took another four years to pass the law. But uh, there is now a new transition government in place uh, called the Bangsamore Transition Authority. And, um, and uh, it's been there for about a year now. And what do we see now in terms of political participation for women? In terms of numbers, the data under the current transition is still far from ideal. Women make up 13 of 80 assembly members, the appointed or the nominated assembly members, because this is still the transition. They have not yet been elected. Election will take place maybe two years later. The MILF appointed only five out of 41 nominees, and the government appointed eight out of the 39 that's allocated for government to put into the assembly, making up only, women therefore only made up about 16%. Uh, that's still not a good number. But what compensates for this is the fact that these are really high quality women. So I think this is what we mean when we say um, meaningful participation emphasizes the kind of impact that women have in the process. Of course, numbers are important, but at the end of the day, it's that kind of impact that is most significant. And what do we see here in, uh, in the assembly, for instance, you will find that there's a lot of reliance on uh, very young women, in fact, a lot of very young women, um, uh, some in their early 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, mostly who are assuming uh, very significant positions in the assembly. The minority leader is a woman. The deputy majority leader is a woman. Several women held, um, chaired committee, uh, some of the committees that 
uh, were put up and they also shepherded the, some of the first laws that have been put in place, including the um, creation of a Bangsamoro, uh, a regional Bangsamoro Women's Commission, a youth and a youth commission. So they had pushed for that, certainly, and, and which um, uh, they did have a big role in from the drafting to the answering of, uh, you know, the interrogation during the, during the, um, the actual deliberation in, in the assembly. In fact, they've been asked to, by the older men, because most of the, uh, most of the nominees, especially from the MILF side, are, are their high-ranking commanders and they're all very senior persons. Um, they, um, they, because they find that these women are very competent, they've been asked precisely to take the lead in a lot of the deliberations. So you will find now that um, in the government itself, in the executive branch, you have two ministers who are women, the Minister for Social Services, which is now a very important agency for, to address not only the regular social amelioration programs, but also the special programs that uh, have become necessary to support the period of the quarantine when people cannot go to work regularly. And on that aspect they have been working with a lot of civic organizations women's organizations there's quite a fairly well developed uh, group of humanitarian um, you know networks a lot of them very active we, actively led by women precisely because of the history of the conflict where you've had to do a lot of relief and rehabilitation and only last year there were earthquakes so that's the kind of um, very significant a uh, role being played now by the Ministry of Social Services that's, that's headed by a former member of the MILF negotiating team, in fact. The Minister for Social Science and Technology is the lone woman in the Central Committee of the MILF, and she is a civil engineer. Uh, the head of the Regional Commission on Bangsamoro Women it was a high-ranking combatant on, of the older Moro National Liberation Front group and the current attorney general is a very young woman working closely with the office of the chief minister. Uh, the law actually provides for only at least one woman in the cabinet, and at least what you find now is that there are four. And hopefully, that as the norms change, as the thinking, and more women are able to prove themselves, then uh, you know get discovered, and the men also are able to, um, to appreciate even more the kinds of contribution women can make. We hope that in succeeding um, uh, governments that will come, there will be even more. Um, let's see. Um, many important laws still need to be passed during this transition, um, and, and they can, can make or break the, again, you know, the, the, the kind of um, numbers that um, how many women will be able to uh, get into elected positions. The election law still has to be um, drafted. Um, uh, there's only one reserved seat in the law and, both, and also in the agreement allocated to women and um, uh, two seats for the other indigenous groups who are not Islam, Islamicized uh, because there are also non-Islamic indigenous peoples in, in the community, but they are a minority and there's a provision there that says there should be gender equity in the allocation of the seats for the non-Moro indigenous peoples. The party law as well still has to be drafted the party law for the uh, for the region they will have their own uh, part, regional party system and it on, it stipulates that uh, the law stipulates that the regional party system shall include uh, women's agenda and shall involve the youth and the women in the electoral nominating processes of uh, these different political parties. Equally important, there's a provision for the creation of council of leaders, which is like a consultative body that will uh, can, can provide that kind of cohesion between the regional government, the local governments, and the civil society. Um, there's, there's a need to make sure that in, in the kind of law that we emerge out of that, yeah, precisely good guarantees for more uh, seats for women. Now, let me go to economic empowerment. Um, I le, here, of course, uh, the, the good news is that there have been relative peace in so far as fighting between the government and the 
MILF is concerned, over the last uh, 12, 13 years, the major fighting stopped in, was in 2008, and that has created a lot of uh, commercial activity. But given the fact that, um, one, number one, the transition is still only a year old, uh, we can't really tell yet the, uh, the, the full economic impact. Moreover, the, the fact is that there are other armed groups and there are still fighting going on. Uh, uh, just about uh, one or two, uh, two years ago, for instance, uh, major fighting destroyed um, the only Islamic city in the Philippines called Marawi because that's where the fighting took place between the, the Philippine um, armed forces and the uh, a violent extremist group and totally destroyed the whole city. So on top of the decades-long impact uh, you know, the delay in economic development, destruction because of the war, you actually have fresh, uh, fresh conflicts taking place and creating massive uh, destruction. And other places as well, you, do, you, you still have uh, these violent extremist groups. Then, of course, now you have COVID-19, um, which has caused some delay in, the, in implementing the reforms that they have been, uh, that the leadership of the new Bangsamoro government has been trying to put in place. Um, it, has, um, it has basically discouraged more investments. We know that investments uh, now, uh, the business community is not in a very good situation as well. Potential tourism, tourism was never really developed in this place precisely because of the, the conflict, but you have wonderful beaches, wonderful you know, waterfalls, every, everything here. But that cannot really proceed. And then, of course, the problem with uh, ensuring uh, good educational access, given the limitations, the new standards that are being imposed now, uh, given uh, we, in the light of um, the, the virus. Although, fortunately, in the case of the Bangsamora, there's very, very, relatively very few cases compared to, say, Metro, Metro Manila. I think. Um, there have only been 11 cases of people who died, um, although, of course, several hundreds more are being monitored and, and testing hasn't really been, um, you know, widely used. In fact, it's only recently that they, they have put up uh, a testing facility in, in, in the region. Uh, uh, tests had to be transported to Metro Manila or to some other testing facilities to be able to get their get the results. So, so that said, um, they're really starting from very low, the Human Development Index. And if you look at the labor force, you will find that uh, more than 50% are actually still in agriculture. And, um, and there's only 50%, I'm citing now 2018 data, there's only 50% employed. And out of that, out of that, 26.1% um, are women which means that there are more unemployed uh, members of the labor force among, among women. Uh, but interestingly, you will find that among college graduates with jobs, there are more women, actually. 58% uh, are female. They are also the majority in the service sector, manufacturing, government service, although the top positions continue to be occupied by males. And uh, typically, you find that them mostly working in the private household or are self-employed in family businesses. And most of the time, they're not even really paid um, the, the full value of, of their work. Now, we find the, uh, that um, uh, the conflict has also affected uh, the overseas Filipino workers. We know that the trend over the decades has been the feminization of overseas Filipino overseas migrant labor, and that's also true for Muslim Mindanao. There are more women. And in fact, a major problem in that area is the human trafficking, where you have underage women uh, working, getting, um, uh, going out illegally to be able to uh, secure employment in uh, other parts of the world. Uh, but uh, as a result of COVID-19 now, you would find that uh, tens and thousands of overseas Filipino workers are coming back, which means that they're coming back without any, any employment um, uh, clearly in sight, especially with the economic downturn here and economic downturn globally. 
Um, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm about to end, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I will end there. Uh, if, uh, just by way of concluding, let's say that how women's political empowerment can be further enhanced depend, depending on the kind of laws that will still be passed. But at the end of the day, um, it's really important that the women themselves inside the community are supported and mobilized to make sure that um, they will become a uh, real motive force. So it's very good that uh, internationally and nationally they are supported by other women's organizations, but they will have to be the backbone of ensuring that all of these needed reforms for women, for everybody, will be put in place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam. Um, we're now just uh, in the interest of time going to move straight on to Ayak Chol Deng Alak, who is the Deputy Coordinator for the South Sudan Civil Society Forum uh, during the negotiations there. And she's been closely involved in the revitalized agreement for the resolution of conflict in South Sudan. So there you are. Would you like to go ahead, uh, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to capitalize on time, I'll just go straight to it. So in South Sudan, women pushed through various mechanisms for the attainment of the 35% uh, affirmative action, which obviously is a bare minimum. And that was courtesy of great organizing by women's movement led by the South Sudan Women's Coalition and support from the wider civil society and the youth movement as well. Uh, pre, uh, the presence of a transgenerational, robust technical support team and lobby groups lobbying across tracks, you know, dramatized tactics, and honestly, just putting horrific images out of, outside negotiating, negotiating halls and wearing black uh, are some of the things that really, um, you know, push for this. The presence of support from the guarantors, uh, women in uh, having, uh, pushing for a woman in the mediation team. Um, uh, one of the lead mediators was uh, Tete from Ghana. And um, just uh, having a, the lead mediator coming from a civil society background, um, naming and shaming political parties that did not have women participation, are some of the things that helped South Sudan uh, push from 25% quota to a 35% affirmative action by the end of the peace process. That having been said, the ARSIS implementation is still uh, very, very slow. Um, although we have seen for the first time uh, you know, a woman sitting as the defense minister, we have seen a woman sitting as the foreign affairs minister, uh, and this is still causing a huge ripple effect in the women, you know, in the women's movement and women across from young girls to, you know, even women in political spaces. We are still in awe that this has come to pass. It still is nothing because so far we only have four female ministers out of the 32 ministers. 35% um, is not being adhered to. All the pre-transitional uh, mechanisms uh, only one is headed by a woman out of six. We have less than 20% women in these pre-transitional uh, mechanisms. Um, so far, the only um, arm of government that has been formed is the executive arm of government. And um, out of the six, um, you know, the president, the first vice president, and four vice presidents, we only have one woman as a vice president. That is just a clear violation. Um, uh, it also shows that most of the attention here in South Sudan is, is given to women at the national level. So imagine it being this hard to adhere to this 35% affirmative action at national level. It only means it gets difficult as people move down towards the counties and you know, towards the local government. This also means for us that there needs to be more mapping of women. There needs to be uh, more mapping of women uh, just to ensure they're empowered politically to claim political space at local level. And for us, the challenges are the same. The challenges, we are in a very patriarchal context. Uh, we still do not have family laws in our constitutional, in our constitution. The political spaces are extremely hostile for women. Um, even during the peace talks, like women were harassed, they were, you know, uh, you know, in 
intimidated just for the fact that they were women and there was a sense that we can because they are weaker you know assumed to be weaker um it's also difficult for women to participate politically because you need money to dish out and women are not you know are not at the same space as men uh political parties are more likely to invest in men as opposed to investing in women and so we see less and less women uh pushing for for higher positions um the other big big challenge for us is the shit civic space it's continuously shrinking um during the peace talks we had civil society actors threatened in the corridors uh, of the peace negotiations and as a result we have members female members of civil society who were unable to come back home right after the talks that's the thing um there are not so many women to begin with in this civic space uh having women uh feeling threatened intimidated only makes the space um you know a no go zone for other women who would have that as a platform to uh to amplify the voices um we also have the issues of corruption and nepotism and we have even seen it uh right now in the currently formed uh you know executive arm of government um there is um appointment of personnel with uh very minimal technical expertise uh because a regional balance is very important and political balance is uh very important and for some reason uh you know the technical know-how and skill is taking a back seat uh then additionally we have you know lack of accountability and punitive action um so there is no adherence to time frames no adherence to the 35% affirmative action no adherence to a lot of violations a resurgence of pockets of conflicts there is nobody to hold parties accountable and so there is a sense of belligerence um as a result of that uh there are also non signatory uh, armed groups and that is also that is always a threat to any peace process and to any peace agreement um additionally there is resurgence of intercommunal conflict and this has always been a trend uh prior to formation of new governments uh we see uh communal conflicts uh, spurring and you know one community leader you know trying to uh you know just a, a flex military might and and you know push for their appointment as a governor or county commissioner you know and and as we see peace processes are incentivizing um uh, you know war because it takes people to kill and you know to to rape and to slaughter before and then they're considered worthy of negotiating peace on a peace table it's it's ironic but uh that's the status of things so so far when it comes to peace implementation we're doing very very slow now I'm sorry to interrupt but if you could wrap up please in about 1 minute thank you covid-19 uh has brought south sudan to a standstill the peace process is obviously still stalling uh this all the finances that are available at the national coffers very few which actually make it to the national coffers are directed to a covid-19 responses there's increased rates of lawlessness particularly gang rape of women by men in uh, in uniform there's huge technological gaps um you know we are still a 2g internet in south sudan so it's very difficult for women uh you know to have access to webinars like this and others um South Sudanese families families are languishing in poverty not just in South Sudan but in the refugee camps in the region uh in the diaspora where they seek education um civilians in protection of civilian sites within the country are at higher uh risk of experiencing starvation uh gender based violence uh disease and even death uh in this in the in the wake of covid 19 uh thank you very much Thank you so much and thank you so much for sticking to time as well much appreciated so just to to recap so far we've heard from three post conflict contexts Colombia the Philippines and South Sudan where women are struggling to enact to implement the gender provisions that um are in the peace agreement that they fought so hard for 
This is anyway a precarious transitional moment in all three countries, and it's made even more so by the COVID pandemic. So I'm now going to transition to our last speaker, uh, Mireille Afa, who's the Peace and Security Policy Specialist on issues of mediation and conflict resolution, and she manages the African Women Leaders Network. We've asked her for reasons of time to focus on what UN Women is doing to ensure women's participation in peace processes during the COVID pandemic. Uh, thank you very much, Anne-Marie. Uh, I hope uh, you can all hear me clearly. And uh, thank you uh, to the uh, Center for Global Affairs and to the Global Network of Women Peace Builders uh, for inviting UN Women to uh, co-host uh, this timely meeting. Uh, I think I would like to start very briefly by, by saying that the benefits of women's participation on the inclusion of gender provisions in peace agreements complement the key takeaway that uh, we got from the 2015 global study on the implementation of uh, Security Council Resolution 1325, which highlighted the, the importance of women's participation and influence to the success and the sustainability of peace processes. These findings contribute to shaping UN women's work on mediation uh, here at headquarters, but mostly through our country and regional offices. And in 2019, UN women supported over 480 women's organizations and networks in 26 countries across, uh, across the world for their meaningful participation in conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and peace building in their communities and their countries. And now in the context of COVID, uh, over the world, we, we see that uh, the, the severe impacts of the pandemic uh, on physical and mental health, social and economic conditions, human rights, are compounded uh, by pre-existing gender uh, discriminations, which uh, disproportionately uh, affect women. Uh, these consequences are further worsened in fragile and conflict-affected contexts, uh, with increased insecurity and uh, uh, challenges to uh, much-needed humanitarian assistance. And as, as a result, the relative gains that uh, we achieved over 20 years of implementing the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and trying to push for increased women's participation in uh, peace processes are at serious risk of uh, reversal. To continue facilitating and advocating for women's meaningful participation in peace processes uh, despite the, the current pandemic, uh, what we do uh, at UN Women, we support, we continue to support women's organizations and women's networks, networks of, of leaders, women leaders, uh, women peacemakers, women uh, peace builders, women mediators. And uh, for example, in uh, DRC and Yemen, we saw that. Uh, several groups, women's groups, have endorsed uh, the Secretary General's uh, call for a global ceasefire. And uh, these efforts need to be amplified, need to be supported, and that's what we are doing. In other countries, women uh, advocate for their uh, participation and leadership in uh, national mechanisms that are established to respond to the COVID crisis. Uh, we see that in Nigeria, in Georgia, uh, 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 in different countries. And these efforts also need uh, to, to continue to, to be supported. In Afghanistan, women continue to demand their meaningful inclusion in the uh, coming intra-Afghan peace process. Uh, we do uh, provide support uh, to, their, to their advocacy work, to their efforts. And in Burundi, uh, women, uh, local women mediators continue to promote uh, social cohesion, continue to build peace uh, in their communities. And UN Women uh, support the national uh, network of women mediators in Burundi. How do we support these networks? Uh, I would like to focus on three main strategies. And I think uh, the first one is it's, it's common. We know that uh, uh, women's organizations, women's peace work, uh, receive uh, very limited uh, funding. Uh, the funding is often not uh, adequate, it's not uh, sustainable. And uh, we continue to, uh, to, to see that funding actually threatens not only uh, the programming, but also the survival of uh, uh, women civil society organizations. So UN Women serves as secretariat of the Women, Peace and uh, Humanitarian Fund. And uh, in this context of COVID, the uh, Women, Peace and Humanitarian Fund has opened an emergency response window 
that is uh, uh, providing funding to women civil society groups in 25 countries uh, across the world. I think I can also quickly mention the Secretary General's uh, Peace Building Fund and the Gender and Youth Promotion Initiative that also uh, facilitates uh, the, the increased participation of women in peace and political processes. And I believe it is the focus of this year's uh, initiative. Another strategy that we need to, to look at, and the UN Women has started uh, also uh, paying closer attention, is the, 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 the digital uh, divide that uh, we hear. Like, uh, non, we hear also that uh, several peace processes have moved online. Women don't always have, uh, have uh, uh, access to internet and uh, uh, telephone uh, opportunities. And UN Women is trying to uh, provide this support and to uh, ensure that uh, when, whenever possible, women can uh, participate in online consultations, in online discussions. And in Libya, what we are uh, seeing is where our colleagues are preparing uh, women for uh, a political process. They have moved uh, training opportunities online and organized uh, uh, negotiations, uh, workshops uh, on, uh, over uh, the internet. And the, the last point I would like to mention in terms of support to the networks is the issue of security and protection. Uh, I think we, 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 we increasingly hear civil society complaining how uh, they are threatened, they are abused uh, because of their peace building work. And I think it's something that needs to be addressed. We also heard even uh, women civil society uh, who have briefed the Security Council uh, being threatened when they go back to their countries. I think we need to uh, make sure that women peace builders are protected against these threats and abusers. And we also need to ensure the protection of women who are now getting involved in the response to the COVID crisis in the public space. And uh, I, I would also like to add, including online and providing online security and in the private space uh, with uh, uh, what we now know as the, the shadow pandemic and the increase of the domestic violence. Uh, in addition to women's uh, networks, uh, we do uh, work with uh, member states. Member states are uh, very strong partners uh, with uh, DPO, DPPA, uh, that often leads uh, peace operations, peace processes. On the ground, UN Women uh, works to promote women's participation uh, and their inclusion in the implementation and monitoring of uh, peace and political agreements. We heard about South Sudan. We also uh, do work in the Central African Republic, Colombia uh, and Mali and elsewhere. Uh, we support uh, member states in the implementation of their national action plans. And uh, increasingly what we are also doing is to make sure that uh, the implementation of WPS NAPS, Women, Peace and Security NAPS is linked to the national and local responses uh, plans uh, to COVID-19. Uh, and we have started uh, seeing that in Jordan, but I believe uh, like uh, colleagues in the region are now preparing a comprehensive research, not only to encourage uh, uh, these linkages, but to see how to, uh, to support that. Uh, UN Women, another uh, like uh, area of support to member states, UN Women serves as secretariat to the Security Council informal expert group on women, peace and security, as well as to the uh, WPS Focal Points Network. These are uh, platforms that have already discussed the linkages between COVID and the women, peace and security agenda. Finally, we support women's engagements with uh, regard to the actual peace processes and the implementation of peace agreements. And there I would like to mention the, the much needed uh, focus on gender uh, responsive conflict analysis to be able to identify not only the needs and uh, priorities of women that could be discussed both in the peace process, but also in terms of the response, but also to map women who are there and who are already doing uh, the, the, the peace building work, the, the peacemaking work, the conflict prevention work, who are valid participants to any processes. And I think we, we would like to continue pushing for a, a, a revised design of peace processes that include women from the start. We promote women's uh, political particip participation and leadership uh, as a way to, by facilitating, encouraging the inclusion uh, in established implementation and monitoring mechanisms. We also promote women's economic empowerment to ensure peace interventions, including women's own peace interventions at community level are sustained through economic recovery and the uh, quick impacts project. And finally, uh, with, uh, our civil society partner, we advocate for uh, the adoption of special measures 
for increasing women's uh, participation uh, through uh, gender quotas and adapting what has happened in the like national field in terms of uh, political participation to peace processes, uh, reserve seats. And we are glad to see that uh, the uh, February uh, uh, Geneva talks for Libya included uh, reserve seats for women and uh, civil society women are also asking for uh, specific uh, delegations of human peace builders to uh, be allowed to participate in the, the peace processes. In conclusion, I would like to recall that women's participation in peace processes is one of the six priority areas of accelerated implementation that the Secretary General uh, has identified uh, for this year, uh, 20, uh, this year 20th anniversary of uh, Resolution uh, 1325. As we are striving to uh, build peaceful and inclusive society, uh, let's ensure that uh, no uh, UN-led or co-led peace process is again conducted uh, without women. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Mireille, and thank you to Miriam, to Ayak, and to Nigeria. I am going to pass straight to Mavic uh, now to uh, handle the question and answer. Please remember, if you want to post a question, you can do so in the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. So over to you, Mavic. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, and I add my thanks to our outstanding panelists. And before I go on, I would like to um, yeah, rem uh, inform our uh, wonderful audience members that we will be extending for 10 minutes. Uh, the, as you've, you've heard, the presentations are very rich and we have so many thought-provoking questions, so please uh, stay with us. Um, so without uh, further ado now, uh, we are on the uh, another exciting part of our um, event, uh, the interventions from the floor or interventions from cyberspace. And I will start uh, by introducing our first dis discussant, uh, who is uh, Signe Gillen. Uh, who is the Deputy Head of Mission at the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Riyadh, who is covering Yemen. But before this position, she was Deputy uh, Head of Mission at the Norwegian Embassy in South Sudan. And, and uh, she has uh, uh, supported and, and followed closely the peace negotiation, of course, including the uh, National Action Planning on Resolution 1325. Uh, Signe, I would like to call on you now to share your insights on um, what had been discussed, the absolute necessity of women's participation, integration of uh, gender uh, perspectives in, in peace agreements uh, based on your experiences in South Sudan and now in Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I, I was uh, I came to South Sudan uh, the summer of 2016, just after the uh, parties uh, went back to war, and then I left uh, South Sudan in the fall of 2019. Uh, when the uh, revitalized uh, agreement was uh, signed and uh, they started the implementation of that uh, agreement. And uh, I'm very happy to see Ayak in, the, in this panel. Um, uh, and um, and uh, I, I will not dwell too much on South Sudan because she was uh, explaining these issues, uh, of course, uh, very, very thoroughly. And, uh, but I will, I will draw on some of the lessons that we have had from, from that uh, process. Um, I'm now currently in, uh, in Riyadh, where we also cover the neighboring countries, including Yemen. Uh, we had some meetings with the Yemenis uh, um, in the fall, and uh, in October we received uh, a proposal or, or the draft uh, of, of their National Action Plan for Peace. Uh, and they uh, and we have had a dialogue on that ever since, and they were uh, they they have uh, um, agreed on the action plan or approved action plan in the cabinet on the sixth of December. Um, I don't think we were the first one who was told about the action plan, but we reached out, uh, and uh, you could say, and uh, we have also. Uh, advocated for the action plan um, in, in other forums um, and, and in other 
um, such as uh, to the to the envoy office and and to the UN women and to 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 others. Uh, why I think it's important to focus on the on the national action plan by the legitimate uh, government uh, is that it's a commitment from from Yemen as a state and a country, and it gives a direction uh, that also women's participation and meaningful participation in the peace process is uh, utmost important, uh, and it's built of course on their own lessons learned from. Uh, previous negotiations where they actually had very few or one woman participating in the peace negotiation in Stockholm. Um, when it comes to the to the to the crosscuts of of South Sudan and Yemen, I would say that you can't start early enough uh, to include the gender lens on both com uh, conflict analysis and, of course, on inclusivity. Uh, of women in the processes. Uh, another thing is that uh, uh, when you think about uh, uh, security and you think about uh, protection, it's also about human security and it, it's a cross cr crossover from, from armed conflict to humanitarian uh, protection. And, uh, and uh, you have to, to have a wide, uh, wide perspective on, on security. And in, in that sense, women are utmost important. In Yemen today, you have, a, you have very capable uh, uh, women locally in Yemen who are actually uh, mediators uh, on, on humanitarian access, on prison release, and, and, uh, and so on. And they, are, um, and they are, of course, also left uh, sometimes alone because uh, uh, war is also um, the time where men have to flee or, or or and you have to protect yourself and you have to start meddling into the to the whole uh, complex uh, situation that you live in. I think also that the COVID-19 is just an example uh, of how important this is, actually is. Um, so. The, when you look at the different interactions with women in these kind of processes, you have the diaspora, who is of course very important, but I also want to emphasize uh, the, the uh, huge resources that, that are there from, from local mediators and, and the female negotiators and, um, and peace builders, and, uh, which is a lot more difficult to um, have um, what can I say? Have access to when you are when you are working from from outside and and trying to support these processes uh, from a distance um, because we don't have any embassies um, or embassy in 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 Yemen. Uh, I think also it's very important to link up the different uh, uh, contribution to such processes. So uh, Norway is uh, uh, then supporting the national plan, but we are also supporting, of course, uh, Martin Griffiths uh, and the Envoy's office. Uh, we are supporting the UNDP uh, peace, uh, peace efforts, and, uh, and uh, we are supporting the, the observers in uh, Hodaida. So it's, uh, it, it needs also to, to, to be supported all these different uh, resources. And um, it's also interesting to see the, the development uh, where we also, uh, I would say that um, Martin Griffith's office is, is uh, mainstreaming gender down to the different uh, subgroups uh, dealing with everything from uh, the security to to economy so it's not as it's it's fixed in a gender advisor <laughs> um, but i'm sure she's been working very good in the team uh, but but it's throughout the whole uh, the whole operation which i think is very important uh, when it comes to the to the to the to the inclusivity um, and and the different tracks one two three I think all of them are important. However, it is really important that uh, women are not sidelined, as if they are consulted on the side of the process, but that they are 
consulted as part of the process. That's very important, and it's important uh, as as uh, as we have heard all the other ones talking about. Uh, a few women are actually in the armed groups that uh, are negotiating ceasefire, and very few women are also given space at the political party. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it's a long road to make sure that that will be the future for those involved. Uh, but, but at the same time, they are in the conflict and they are resolving the conflict. So uh, it's a good, uh, I, I just have a reflection somehow, and I got it from another web, uh, webinar <laughs> uh, from another participant, that, that sometimes they should be given a space at the office, now, now at the table uh, themselves as uh, female, um, uh, female um, mediators. Um, when that is said, I also want to, to have another uh, thought, which is that I think we often fall into a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation that women should uh, be uh, totally united, otherwise they failed. And I think it's very important to recognize that they are part of conflict. And of course, then they have also conflicting views on how to solve the conflict when they are in the middle of it or even trying to negotiate themselves out of it. Um, I think that's um, that's also very important. Um, we have to allow, or it's it's it needs to be a space where people can actually be very very um, uh, coming from different uh, positions. Signe, thank you so much. I would request you to wrap up, um, but yeah, please, um, if you have one more point. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful intervention. I would now uh, uh, proceed by um, pointing out to the questions, directing them to the speakers. I will go uh, speaker by speaker, and we'll start with uh, the questions for Miriam. Uh, Miriam, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. So, Miriam, we have a question from Mariam from Mali, <laughs> um, so uh, who asked um, or who shared that in Mali there are less than two percent of women in monitoring committee of the peace agreement. How do we increase the participation of women in the implementation of peace agreements and in peace building? Uh, the second question is, um, what are the links between implementation or non-implementation of peace agreements? and vulnerability to violent extremism. And then uh, from, uh, um, sorry, uh, we have a lot. Uh, from Zarin from the UK, you mentioned widows as a vulnerable group. What kind of measures are there in place uh, uh, that, um, yeah, support widows? Um, and then from Abir uh, in Lebanon, I'm interested in how women's lack of economic empowerment can fuel the recruitment by violent extremist groups. And then one more from uh, Mariam from Mali. How can women be more effectively included also in prevention and response to new threats, including violent extremism? Over to you, Miriam. Uh, the question was had to do with, uh, of Mariam had to do with uh, participation in monitoring, right? So it's true that if the design uh, provided in the agreement does not uh, enable or at least um, create that kind of a push for more women getting into this formal track, then certainly there's no reason why uh, the women should not form a parallel track. Um, and uh, we did see that in our experience in the CISFAR, for instance, local civil society groups formed their own uh, ceasefire watchdog. And that group actually was led by a woman, uh, a woman peace advocate who has, be, who has had a long history in the NGO movement in uh, Southern Philippines. And they got so good in supporting the monitoring precisely because they had women in the community. You know, they put up, eventually when they got a slot into the official mechanism for the civilian protection component, they put up an all women team in this community. So part of their strength precisely had to do with the fact that they're located in the communities. And if you want to monitor conflict, if you want to prevent conflict, you need eyes and ears on the ground. And that's the kind of 
role that many of these um, uh, active uh, women as well as men uh, in the communities have uh, have uh, provided and earned for themselves that kind of, um, of official recognition as a partner in uh, in the monitoring. So um, it's an it's a very dangerous job, certainly at the, during situations of conflict. But um, there are more than enough brave women who will take on the, the challenge. The um, second question had to do with the connection between uh, violent extremism and non-implementation or implementation of uh, peace agreements. I think uh, that was our problem, certainly here, the fact that it took a long time to come up. It took 17 years to finish the agreement. In the meantime, you had groups leading the MILF, uh, forming um, this uh, joining uh, Al Qaeda first, and then also ISIS, uh, or wish to be affiliated with ISIS plus the regional variants called Jama Islamiyah. And there's a problem. Uh, the longer it takes in uh, putting in first for the agreement, and then the longer it takes to implement the real reforms on the ground, uh, then uh, the greater the danger of opening up spaces to different uh, ideologies, uh, especially violent ideologies. And that certainly puts at risk um, everyone. It can create a serious problem. But what we're seeing now is very good security cooperation between the government and the MILF forces on, on the ground on this matter. Uh, yeah. Um, OK, am I muted? Oh, I'm not. All right. Sorry, there's so many. I didn't know there's, there's one more, Miriam. Uh, from Soc Reyes from Manila. The proposed Gender and Development Code has deleted a number of progressive provisions in the GAD Code, Gender and Development Code, of the defunct autonomous region in uh, Muslim Mindanao, uh, for example, on reproductive health uh, provisions. Uh, please comment. And then another one from her. Um, uh, she learned from her research on decision making in the Bangsamora Transition Authority that a uh, few women MPs, members of parliament, make brilliant interventions. While they make uh, brilliant interventions, they are overruled by the dominant male political leaders. So comment on that too. Development uh, draft code for that. And um, I can imagine that on reproductive issues, there will be a lot of uh, uh, you know, very co conservative positions. And that's not only true in the, uh, in the Islamic community. We had our own problems passing in the national law on reproductive health, precisely because of, uh, um, first, like in, in the national, at the national level, is the Catholic Church that opposed that. And then when it comes to the region, you would have the religious uh, uh, Islamic um, influence that will cut back on uh, many of these uh, gender and uh, gender provisions. So uh, with regard to uh, the legislative process, what we see is a real dynamic. It's the real polit there's real politic taking place. Any ruling party, and in this instance, the MILF is the ruling party, try to control the process as much as they can. Most of the laws will have to pass through their scrutiny before this is actually uh, this actually um, happens. But the, the thing is that there is that kind of uh, push and pull, and the women are doing a lot of the pushing and the pulling to ensure that as much as possible, many of these progressive laws, um, many of the gender uh, gender responsive provisions are put in place in the different uh, components. So it's it's very interesting that they, as I said, they they are tasking women to do a lot of the the, the groundwork for this. For instance, this ad administrative code and the civil code, which will be a cabinet file bill, are actually being written by. MILF women professionals, a lawyer and uh, the, the two ministers appointed by the MILF, and they do have quite good um, uh, perspective on, on the gender issue. So it's a dynamic. It's, it's, not a, you know, it's not a given thing that it will be easy, right? But if you ask women themselves, they find that they are, they are uh, meaningfully being engaged. They're not dummies of anyone, that they are actually struggling and they are also succeeding, but not all the time. Thank you, Miriam. Now, uh, over to, uh, to you, Ayak. 
The first question, how can we ensure meaningful participation of young women in peace processes? Uh, that's from uh, Rose uh, Mbone from Kenya. Uh, another one, how can we genuinely empower young women peace builders? Uh, related question. Uh, how can we engage men in, as allies in peace processes? That's from Diana Holun Madsen. Uh, and then, oh yeah, okay, those are the two questions for you, Aya. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, in our part, engaging young women, first of all, there is no way you're going to do a peace process without women, considering we are the majority. We're not just the majority as young people. We're, we constitute over 66% of the population. Uh, what we did was we ensured that there was um, um, collaboration between the women's movement and the youth movement. We ensured that the technical um, teams were working in harmony. We had, you know, cross interactions between the technical teams. We also ensured that um, at the peace process, we ensured that we, we uh, looked at different political parties' constitution, looked at their youth quotas, and ensured uh, that they, they included those young people in those spaces. When we also lobbied to have a, um, a separate uh, youth representative, not just youth in the uh, civil society category or in the women's category or as part, but we also had a youth representative on the peace talks. That ensured that a lot of youth issues that were cross-cutting were clearly tabled and were not overlapped by other issues. Uh, that is very important. I think we, what we need to see, we need to see young people as part of the mediation team. What we saw in the South Sudan peace process, we saw women, we saw one woman as part of the mediation team. What we could have done better is push because we have a lot of young mediators. And if we, I believe if we had a youth, one of the youth mediators and a youth um, representative, um, you know, in the, ad, uh, a youth uh, advisor to the, to the mediation, I think we would have seen better results, uh, more clear, definitive, um, uh, you know, benchmarks in the peace process regarding youth um, participation. So far, we're doing good. Uh, empowering of young women, I think that is a long journey. I think that, you know, it's cross-cutting, not, you know, cultural, social, politically, economically. It is a cross-cutting issue. I think this is something we can delve into, like, more and more. But, you know, I think it always starts by, have, by having women at the at policy making positions, ensuring the intentional inclusion of young women. We need to see um, people that we can be inspired by. And it is very difficult when the people that you're relating to are, are men, uh, you know, mostly old men. We want to see more women. We want to see more women because to empower you need reference uh, and engaging men as allies i think uh, our civil society is doing incredible uh, all the most of the youth groups in south sudan are very very feminist but that is from the civil society standpoint we're opening social media pages and we're challenging uh, gender norms through different platforms to just open discussion for uh, you know, for, for, to, to bring in more allies and for the voices of other allies to be heard. Thank you so much, Ayak. And now uh, on to Mireya. The first question is from Pierre David Jan uh, from the Mission of uh, Canada to the UN. Uh, on women's economic development, what are the differences between empowerment through the formal versus informal sector? The second question is from Rahama Baloni from Mercy Corps in Nigeria. There is still very little support for peace building programs that encompasses economic empowerment. This is relatively due to donor focus. How can we overcome this? Uh, from Tandy from South Africa, what more can be done to ensure that women are not only included in decision making for their economic empowerment, but to ensure that they are capacitated to be able to make a living for themselves and sustain their lives and that of their families. Uh, from Ruth, Ruth Jacobson from the UK, as your research, I guess this is more, uh, this is also for uh, Potani and, and uh, uh, other students. Uh, um, has your research been able to throw any more light on the relationship between women's property and land rights and vulnerability and reintegration after conflict? Do you think the impact of COVID-19 will intensify this uh, vulnerability? Over to you, Mariah. 
Uh, thank you, Mavik. I think all the questions relate to women's economic empowerment, which is a separate section of uh, you and women, but I will try to uh, address uh, the ones uh, I can. In terms of formal and informal uh, like empowerment of women, I think women are mostly, uh, and we see it with the, the impact of COVID, women are mostly uh, involved in, in, formal, uh, in the informal sector of the economy, and this uh, has again uh, worsen the, 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 the impact of the crisis on them. And when, if we want to differentiate between uh, their informal and their formal uh, empowerment and in relation to the implementation of peace agreements, I like to believe that it is uh, related to the economic policies of the member states. Um, like looking at uh, uh, this uh, sector, uh, I think we are we are trying and i would like to take the example of the the african women leaders network and where each time we hear women are not uh, uh, micro so why should we only focus on the uh, uh, micro activities or micro pro projects and i mentioned the quick impact projects and i think it's also related to that but at the same time they shouldn't be left out because these are activities that uh, allow them to uh, to just to uh, sustain uh, their, their families their communities uh, day to day but at the same time i think we need major investments in uh, 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 in women's activities in, in women in business and for the african women leaders network there's this african women leadership uh, fund that has been established and which uh, seeks to uh, really boost uh, women's economic empowerment by investing in uh, women uh, fund managers women uh, business uh, owners and really providing support that is consequent and uh, that is also uh, sustainable. So there are uh, discussion ongoing with uh, uh, possible funders and including uh, several banks. And I believe this is also a, a way of uh, making sure that even in terms of uh, like big investment, macro uh, 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 investment, women can also be uh, supported and their, their economic empowerment can be uh, sustained. Um, in terms of capacity, right, for, uh, I, I think I missed the second question, but in terms of capacity, uh, capacitating uh, women for their uh, uh, economic empowerment, UN Women has uh, 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 several programs, and I would like to uh, mention the one on uh, climate smart agriculture, which is uh, uh, rolled, uh, being rolled out, especially uh, in the Sahel region uh, and across uh, Western Central Africa. Uh, it is about making sure that uh, women involved in agriculture uh, receive the necessary uh, knowledge and the skills. And I think there is also a connection to making sure that uh, they are able to, uh, to circulate or to distribute actually the, 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 the results of their, their economic activities. So it's, it's, it involves training, but I think it also involves uh, providing uh, concrete actual uh, opportunities not only to to produce more to produce better but also to be able to to sell more and including uh, i think this is what the the project is also uh, trying to do including by using new technologies for women to to make sure that like as soon as the the or even before uh, the, 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 the crops are ready, they are able to identify uh, like the markets where they, they, they will be able to, to, uh, to uh, produce or to sell their, their products. So uh, this is uh, what I see as like capacitating women uh, beyond uh, uh, like uh, maybe micro uh, investment and also uh, beyond the rhetoric. I think it has to be concrete, it has to be uh, sustainable and uh, we are also uh, talking about it in the current context. Uh, the COVID crisis is affecting uh, women, but uh, livelihoods and especially investment in agriculture remains uh, uh, much needed, much ne uh, necessary. I think it's also one way that will uh, lead us uh, towards the end of the crisis. And we are trying to make sure that uh, we are going to rebuild uh, better, we are going to rebuild greener, and, uh, and this is uh, also an, an area that uh, we need to pay uh, close attention to, to make sure that, yes, women are part of the uh, reconstruction, the recovery uh, after the, the health crisis, but after uh, all, uh, like, your peace and security uh, challenge uh, that uh, they may face in a conflict context. 
In terms of research, I believe on women's property and uh, land, land rights, uh, this, this is an issue. Uh, I think land, land conflict is uh, one of, one of the, the, the main uh, causes of, uh, of conflict. And it's not only Africa. I think it's uh, uh, m like across, across the world. It is already uh, major for uh, like human beings in general, communities in general, and I think it's even worse for women who are often uh, discriminated in terms of uh, land deeds, in terms of uh, yes, uh, owning access to land and exploiting lands. Uh, I, I can check with colleagues if we have a specific research that look at uh, women's access to land, and I'm sure we do and uh, uh, what are the, the priorities or the recommendations that uh, we, 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 we propose. Uh, I will go back again to the African Women Leaders Network. There's also a big focus on uh, women in agriculture and to try to make sure that, uh, yes, uh, women's contributions, which again are often very informal, uh, uh, are able to, to, to count in a sustainable manner, in a consequence manner, in uh, uh, economic uh, policies of, uh, of countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mireille. And, and just because there's so much interest on women's economic empowerment, I wonder whether uh, Futeni can take uh, 30 seconds and say, uh, yeah, explain a little bit more on research on economic assets. Futeni? Thank you. Um, very briefly, we developed a difference in difference statistical model. We looked at data five years before to five years after the conflict. Um, we looked at the formal sector in this research, but the informal sector is definitely one of the areas that needs more attention. Um, also, the structure of the economy, the care burden, the migrant chain care, um, care chain, sorry. Um, and in terms of land, this is one of the demands that women most frequently pose when um, they talk about economic empowerment and peace agreements. Um, results are very uneven, but the, uh, what we, when we looked at the PAX database, the University of Edinburgh Peace Agreement database, uh, we only found 36 provisions that, um, economic provisions in all of the, of the 660 um, agreements in the database, we only found 36 that had some type of economic provision. So we feel that there is not enough in there to address the structural problems in the, um, in women, for women's economic empowerment. Thank you. As always, all very interesting discussions run out of time. So please uh, visit our uh, social media pages, the NYU Center for uh, Global Affairs and uh, Global Network of Women Peace Builders, and you'll be directed to uh, the full uh, report, which was also uh, shared on our chat box, chat box and, and you'll also receive information on our uh, follow-up uh, research initiatives. On behalf of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders and our co-sponsors, the NYU Center for Global Affairs and UN Women, and my co-moderator, Professor Anne-Marie Getz, please join me in thanking our amazing panelists and our donors and all of you, our very enthusiastic uh, audience members. Thank you again, everyone. Stay safe and healthy.